I got interested, I, 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 can, I, I can clearly remember and describe the day, which was the day when I picked up the 19, I guess, 79 issue of Scientific American with the dung beetle on the cover that had uh, Bernard Despenya's article on Bell's inequality. I'd never heard of it before then. And, uh, you know, I went back and looked at that article and there are lots of things I object to now, but for all that, enough of what Bell did was clear that you could see this is really, really, really deep. This is really surprising, really shocking, really profound, has seems to have direct empirical consequences. So you can really talk about checking whether this is, you know, whether you're going to violate these things. Right. Um, and it was just the most astonishing thing. I mean, I, 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 I read, I was reading the thing in my room, which was on the first floor, I was in college. And, uh, and pacing, I was just walking, <laughs> holding the thing and walking in circles pacing. And I know that because I had friends who were outside and they saw me and they came in and they said, what's wrong, right? Because they saw me like just with this magazine and this video yeah. on my face, yeah. right? Pacing and pacing and pacing. And yeah. that was it. I mean, as far as you know, I thought, look, you've got to come to terms with this. Um, and it's not kind of vague and hand wavy and, and, and metaphorical or whatever. I mean, this is just solid. And even now you have to explain to people that it's not even about quantum mechanics. I mean, you know, Bell doesn't mention quantum mechanics and there's nothing, no quantum mechanical formalism that goes into the proof, right? I mean, this is just, you go into the lab, <laughs> you know, you, you switch your machines around and you record some data. It, it is such a beautifully simple proof. Yeah, it's just absolutely astonishing <laughs> and not at all what you expect, right? I mean, certainly, again, the, the, the great, regret I have, I mean, regret is the wrong word, but it's, it's sad because it wasn't that much time difference between Bell's proof and Einstein's death. I, I like to believe that Einstein would have seen the point and yeah. his, you know, deep, deep opposition to non-locality confronted with this proof. And then if confronted with the data, he would have, he would have said, well, gee, I just got that wrong. I like to think that, right? Um, but it, it, he, you know, he never had the chance to, to, to see that. Yeah, I mean, that would have been interesting. Yeah, I mean, because people say that he was playing around with De Broglie-like things and rejecting them. Yeah, and you know, and he certainly was not fond of. He knew about De Broglie, and he rejected. He wasn't fond of it. And you think, yeah, because it's manifestly non-local, right? If your main objection to Copenhagen is that it's non-local, that the collapses are non-local. And you look at something like, you know, De Broglie, you're going to say, well, that's just as non-local. It's kind of manifestly non-local. That's right. not helping me. I, I take it that was Einstein's view, but he never saw Bell's proof that you just can't get away from that. Yeah, I mean, Einstein and Schrodinger, till the end, I think, were both very committed to keeping an open mind and and trying to solve these problems and like you mentioned i mean that's probably what stopped them from developing an opposition to to bore uh which i mean bittersweet right yeah and mm -hmm. i think i you know to me it's so frustrating because because when you know when you go back into the history and you see that the non-locality was what Einstein put his finger on already in 1925. I mean, immediately it was like, this is what I don't like about the theory. And finally in, you know, 35, they get up to the EPR stuff, which is a really clean statement. And I, I'm sure, you know, you've tried to read Bohr's response and you're going like, if physicists look at the EPR paper and Bohr's response and say, oh, Bohr won that debate, you're going like, okay, I give up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the EPR paper, it, 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 it just so strong. Like, I think it is just such, such a strong hypothesis over show up and calculate. Like, I don't know, maybe I just haven't read enough of that history or, or Bohr's response, but... 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything to say about it until yeah, and it, and it's made even so, sharper. I mean, the nice thing when you look at the history is that because in the EPR paper they're just looking at position and momentum measurements, it yeah. wouldn't occur to anybody that there were any other measurements that you might be making, right? And then, and then you know, Bohm has this nice idea of just reformulating in terms of spin and looking at spin in orthogonal directions. But as soon as you do that, it immediately occurs to you, well, what if I, instead of you know, doing it like this or doing it like this, what if I you know, continuously start to uh, change these spin directions from each other? And then that gets you right to Bell, right? So right. there's a, you know, you can kind of just go bing, 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 right? I mean, Einstein had this immediate right intuition that involved only a single particle, then kind of hypercharges it in the EPR paper where you're now looking at entangled pairs, but you really only have two observables that you ever think about. And then, you know, Bohm takes that, puts it in the spin context. Now I've got an infinite number of observables that are continuous, you know, continuous groups. And then that gets you to Bell. And, right. you know, I, I mean, and as you know, it, 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 we were that far from Bell's paper just disappearing without a trace. You know, in the first volume of a, of a brand new journal that went under. What happened to Bell? I, I don't know what happened to Bell afterwards. Like, um... well, what happened? You know, what what happened historically was was that among the few people who read Bell's paper, and he got, I think he may have even gotten a preprint of it or something, or a, and I'm not quite sure why was Abner Shimoni. Really, and you know, yeah, and Abner. He had this student, Clauser, right? John Clauser, who was an experimentalist. And then Abner said, oh, look, I mean, first of all, A, Abner understood the significance of what Bell did. And, and that I'm sure is in part because he was, you know, a philosopher as well as, you know, had a philosophical training as well as a physical training. So he could, you know, see, oh, I see what's going on, right? Andy had this student who, who was looking for a PhD project and you say, gee, you know, I think we could actually do this experiment. <laughs> um, but, but again, it was published in, in issue one, volume one of a startup journal that didn't last more than a year or so, I think. And it, 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 it could very well. And, you know, Bell was not a big self-promoter. I mean, the guy was just you know, he's working at CERN, designing magnets and doing this stuff on the weekend. He's such a wonderful man. I mean, I met him several times. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, perfectly modest and just, you know, just a clear thinker. I mean, there were just things that to him were so obvious that you have to fight with other people to get to see. Um, but he wasn't, he certainly was not he didn't seem to have any noticeable ego about this. I mean, he was just trying to get it straight, right? Just trying to get it right. And he would write these papers and they're absolutely fantastic papers. He's a wonderful stylist, wonderful writer. But I, I don't ever have the sense that he was out beating his own drum or trying to draw attention to it, right? It's like, my job is to work this out and write it down clearly and publish it. And then, you know, whatever happens, happens. I mean, that's the sense I got. Yeah, it's interesting to see the similarity between Bell and Everett, where Everett left academia very, very early on as well, right? Where Many Worlds wasn't really, was it that it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't taken seriously for a while, or was it just his ideas? You know, I've heard different things about that, and, and there are people who've worked on, on Everett biography. So there was a kind of dramatic story which I, as I understand it, is actually false, okay? And the dramatic story was Everett worked out many worlds, you know, his, Wheeler was his dissertation director. Wheeler then arranges for Everett to meet Bohr and the Copenhagen people, which all of that is true. Mm -hmm. And Bohr says, no, right, is, is not impressed by Everett. And, you know, they have to kind of boulderize his thesis in order to get it 
And, and then the kind of romantic story is that Wheeler became so disenchanted that he went off and did something else. I've read, however, that's just not true. It's like he never really had any intention to go into, in, into theoretical. He wanted to make a lot of money, which he did. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he- In the wrong place. I mean, he was, um, he, he had an odd personality and not a terribly attractive one. Um, and I think he really did, wasn't interested in being an academic. I think he was much, my impression is he was much happier, you know, <laughs> doing the kind of stuff he did. So I don't know that he was forced out or disillusioned out um, right. as opposed to just, he kind of as an, you know, as a graduate student had this idea and was working with Wheeler. So of course, Wheeler would be very supportive of this large scale thing. Um, and then, and then, you know, he just left and did something else. And then it was only later when Bryce DeWitt kind of revived it, that even it, it, it you more get the sense that Everett himself kind of lost interest in it, right. not for any other reason, but that he was just doing other stuff. And then DeWitt, you know, starts to, starts to really advertise it. And then Everett gets brought back into it a bit. Right. Well, but, I, but I also think Everett's theory is not what people now call many worlds. So yeah. You know, Many worlds I mean, I think the situation is even stranger because he's pushing this relative state stuff and nobody talks about the relative state. And that's just not many worlds as it's now understood. So, okay, yeah. So, so what's happened from, from Everett all the way to what Many Worlds has become today? Well, I, I, my understanding, and again, take this with a grain of salt, is it was DeWitt who kind of rebranded relative state as Many Worlds. And I think maybe even started using that very evocative way of talking about, right? Um, and of course the attraction, anybody who worries about the foundational thing and, and thought as I did when I was young, that the real issue was collapse, right? So the way, when I was really young, the impression I got was that quantum mechanics had these damn collapses and everybody kind of was indicating this Wigner, gosh, maybe the collapses are caused by consciousness. Wow, right. mind body problem, bang, bang, bang. You know? And I remember being very you know, astonished by that and saying, gee, we're really seeing the effects of mind on the world. I, I actually had a very brief conversation with, I think with Shimoni, as a matter of fact, about this when I was a young graduate student. Um, hmm. But if you, you know, if you, if you go that direction, you say, oh gosh, it's all in the collapses. And if the collapses are caused by consciousness, then wouldn't that be amazing? Which of course it would be. <laughs> and, I mean, I actually had the thought you could build a machine that would tell whether something's conscious or not, because you can check whether it could manage to collapse the wave function. <laughs> uh, so if you're, if you're thinking that way, and then, then somebody comes along and says, well, Everett says there are no collapses. Right. And you go, well, I see how that would make a big difference. And then that leads you through this kind of, you know, this argument to then there are many worlds. And then you have something else weird to talk about. Um, I mean, the first time I heard this, I've told the story many times, it's quite true. The first time I met Bell was at this uh, NATO summer school in Ariche, Italy, uh, that was organized by Arthur Miller, like 62 years of uncertainty, I think it was called. Yep. And, you know, there's a volume from it. And, it, and it, it, at that meeting, the talk that Bell gave was about GRW, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of GRW. And Bell, as he had been advertising the pilot wave theory, because he thought it wasn't appreciated, he was now advertising GRW. And I was sitting in the audience listening to this. And again, with this whole background of thinking, the collapses are, you know, what triggers the collapse? What triggers the collapse? And then you sort of say, well, nothing triggers the collapse. <laughs> just, you know, it's random. And, um, and I went up to Bell afterwards, after the talk, and I, and I said, wait, you mean after all of this, like, drama, it just happens? It's just, you know, it, just, <laughs> it just happens? There's no, nothing more to say about it? And I said, you're satisfied with that? And, and Bell looked at me, I mean, he's just such a wonderful man, right? He's very calm. And he, and he just looked at me and he said, you don't appreciate what they've done. 
and he was absolutely right. I mean, it was the correct response, right? And and it, it took me a little while to work through why what they had done was so important. Um, and he was absolutely on target with that, right? But it was a shock because, you know, if you have this Vignarian consciousness collapse in the back of your head and you read GRW and all that's just gone, right? There's yeah. no trigger, right? It's just, a, it's a purely random thing. Yeah. Then you're kind of let down, right? <laughs> and you have to get over your emotional deflation before yeah. you see, you know, that they've actually created a precise, mathematically well-defined theory that you can right. analyze. Right. Yeah. I mean, of all of the theories, I think of everything from quantum mechanics, it's the Schrodinger's cat and many worlds. That's the two most popular. Th those are the ones that are most popularized these days. Yeah. I mean, and as I mean, maybe you've seen there's an interview in which I pointed out, which seemed to be, which was rather a shock to the interviewer that, you know, Schrodinger himself was not trying to convince you that yes. cats can be both dead and alive. Yes. And he thought that was so idiotic that nobody yeah. could believe that, right? Yeah. yeah, it was always supposed to be a reductio argument. He just hated the... She was shocked. You mean, you mean that when we're told about Schrodinger's cat, I say, yeah, that people are pushing it as if Schrodinger was trying to tell you this cat is neither dead or alive until you look. And he said, no, he said, that's so stupid. Nobody would believe that. <laughs>